Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Monday, June 15th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty, grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face for my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Our New Testament reading tonight is from uh, John chapter 15, beginning in verse 12. Jesus, speaking to his disciples, said, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I commanded you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Our Book of Concord reading is from Article 4 on Baptism. This is the second to last part, and then tomorrow evening we will finish it, beginning in paragraph 41. 
Therefore, every Christian has enough in baptism to learn and to do all his life. For he has always enough to do by believing firmly what baptism promises and brings. Victory over death and the devil, forgiveness of sin, God's grace, the entire Christ, and the Holy Spirit with his gifts. In short, baptism is so far beyond us that if timid nature could realize this, it might well doubt whether it could be true. Think about it. Imagine there was a doctor somewhere who understood the art of saving people from death, or even though they died, could restore them quickly to life, so that they would afterward live forever. Oh, how the world would pour in money like snow and rain. No one could find access to him because of the throng of the rich. But here in baptism, there is freely brought to everyone's door such a treasure in medicine that it utterly destroys death and preserves all people alive. We must think this way about baptism and make it profitable for ourselves. So when our sins and conscience oppress us, we strengthen ourselves and take comfort and say, Nevertheless, I am baptized. And if I am baptized, it is promised to me that I shall be saved and have eternal life, both in soul and body. For that is the reason why these two things are done in baptism. The body, which can grasp nothing but the water, is sprinkled and, in addition, the word is spoken for the soul to grasp. Now since both, the water and the word, make one baptism, therefore body and soul must be saved and live forever. The soul lives through the word, which it believes, but the body lives because it is united with the soul, and also holds on through baptism as it is able to grasp it. We have, therefore, no greater jewel in body and soul. For by baptism we are made holy and are saved. No other kind of life, no work upon the earth can do this. Let this be enough about baptism's nature, blessing, and use, for it fulfills the present purpose. Infant Baptism Here a question arises by which the devil through his sex confuses the world. Infant Baptism Do children also believe? Are they rightly baptized? Briefly, we say about this, let the simple dismiss this question from their minds. Refer it to the learned. But if you wish to answer, answer as follows. The baptism of infants is pleasing to Christ, as is proved well enough from his own work. For God sanctifies many of those who have been baptized as infants, and has given them the Holy Spirit. There are still many people even today in whom we perceive that they have the Holy Spirit both because of their doctrine and life. It is also given to us by God's grace that we can explain the scriptures and come to the knowledge of Christ, which is impossible without the Holy Spirit. But if God did not accept the baptism of infants, he would not give the Holy Spirit nor any of his gifts to any of them. In short, during the long time up to this day, no person on earth could have been a Christian. Now God confirms baptism by the gifts of his Holy Spirit, as is plainly seen in some of the church fathers, like St. Bernard, Gerson, John Huss, and others. These people were baptized in infancy, and since the Holy Christian Church cannot perish until the end of the world, the sects must acknowledge that such infant baptism is pleasing to God. For God can never be opposed to himself or support falsehood and wickedness, or for its promotion impart his grace and spirit. This is indeed the best and strongest proof for the simple-minded and the unlearned. For the sects shall not take from us or overthrow this article, I believe in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. Further, we say that we are not very concerned to know whether the person baptized believes or not. For baptism does not become invalid on that account, but everything depends on God's word and command. Now this point is perhaps somewhat difficult, but it rests entirely on what I have said, that baptism is nothing other than water and God's word in and with each other. That is, when the word is added to the water, baptism is valid, even though faith is lacking. For my faith does not make baptism, but receives it. Now baptism does not become invalid, even though it is wrongly received or used. As stated above, it is not bound to our faith, but the word. Suppose a Jewish person should come dishonestly today and with an evil intent, and we should baptize him in all good faith. We must say that his baptism is still genuine, for here is the water together with God's word, even though the person does not receive it as he should. It is like those who go to the sacrament unworthily, yet still receive the true sacrament, even though they do not believe. 
So you see that the objection of the sectarians is empty. As we have said, even though infants did not believe, which, however, is not the case, still their baptism would be valid. We have now shown this. No one should rebaptize infants. Nothing is taken away from the sacrament, even though someone approaches it with evil purpose. So he could not be allowed to take it a second time, the selfsame hour on account of his abuse, as though he had not received the true sacrament at first. That would blaspheme and profane the sacrament in the worst way. How dare we think that God's word and ordinance should be wrong and invalid because we make a wrong use of it? I say, if you did not believe then, believe now and say this, the baptism certainly was right. But I, unfortunately, did not receive it aright. I myself also, and all who are baptized, must say this before God. I come here in my faith and in that of others. Yet I cannot rest in this, that I believe and that many people pray for me. But in this I rest, that baptism is your word and command. It is just like when I go to the sacrament trusting not in my faith, but in Christ's word. Whether I am strong or weak, I commit that to God. But I know this, that he asks me to go, to eat and to drink and so on, and he gives me his body and blood. That will not deceive me or prove false to me. So we do likewise in infant baptism. We bring the child in the conviction and hope that it believes, and we pray that God may grant it faith. But we do not baptize it for that reason, but solely because of God's command. Why? Because we know that God does not lie. I and my neighbor, and in short all people, may err and deceive, but God's word cannot err. They are arrogant, clumsy minds that draw together such ideas and conclusions as these. Where there is not true faith, there also cannot be true baptism. That's as if I would conclude, if I do not believe, then Christ is nothing. Or if I am not obedient, then father, mother, and government are nothing. Is that a correct conclusion, that whenever anyone does not do what he ought, the work that he ought to do shall become nothing and of no value? My dear, just invert the argument and rather draw this conclusion. For this very reason, baptism is something and is right, because it has been wrongly received. For if baptism was not right and true in itself, it could not be misused or sinned against. The saying is, abuse does not destroy the essence, but confirms it. For gold is not the less gold, even though a harlot wears it in sin and shame. And with that colorful image, we will conclude for tonight. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, merciful and holy bridegroom, we grieve the fall of your church. It is our fault that the beauty of your bride is no longer recognized. Therefore, we pray you, give and increase in us faith, love, and hope in you. Root out of us all sins and vice, all strife, all disbelief, all error and heresy. Rebuke the erring. Convert the unbelievers. Bring the rebellious again to the unity of the Christian church, and show them the light of your truth. Protect our shepherd from all danger of body and soul. Bless all pastors and those who administer in the church in the building of your congregation. Grant them success in all things. Equip your whole church with the proof and power of the holy faith. Stand by your witnesses among the nations and further the course of your gospel in all the world. Fill all government with the fear of you and let their ruling serve to foster and preserve peace. Have mercy on our people and country. Let the youth be brought up in discipline and in their right knowledge of you, 
so that they may recognize your law and the way of your salvation. Give constancy and loyalty to all pious teachers. Comfort all the troubled and sorrowful. Impart health of body and soul to the sick. Grant to all pregnant women, according to your mercy, a happy result in their childbearing. To the needy, give bodily and spiritually according to your good pleasure. Let those who travel be commended to the protection of your holy angels, and be a strong help to all who need you. For the sake of your holy wounds, O Jesus. Amen. O God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration, grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, your great mercy in Jesus Christ. Try that again. Almighty and everlasting God, of your great mercy in Jesus Christ, you have granted us forgiveness of sin and all things pertaining to life and godliness. Send us your Holy Spirit that he may rule our hearts, that we, being ever mindful of your fatherly mercy, may serve you in holiness and pureness of living, and may give you continual thanks for all your goodness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.